If you recall last week, we started looking at the graph of F prime and seeing what it tells us about the graph of the function. The big thing that we came across was that if the derivative is positive, then the function is increasing. If the derivative is negative, then the function is decreasing. That is, the sign of the derivative tells us about the direction of the function. But wait, there's more. If the first derivative is increasing, then the function is concave up. If the first derivative is decreasing, then the function is concave down. So the direction of the derivative tells us about the concavity of the function. So for this graph, we can see the derivative is positive on the interval from zero to one. And so our function should increase on the interval from zero to one. Then from the interval on the interval from one to three, our derivative is negative. So the function will be decreasing. And then from three to five, our derivative is positive. So the function will go back to increasing. This raised a question, actually two questions. Two mysteries came up from this. Number one, by how much is the function going to increase? And number two, from where do we start? So I gave you some secret information. By how much does it increase? So thinking about this increase in the function. This raised two mysteries. Number one, how much of an increase? We know that the amount goes up, but we don't know by how much. And we answered that by thinking about moving at a constant speed and realizing that distance is equal to rate times time is the same as area is equal to length times width. It's the same as your gross pay is your hourly wage times the number of hours. Is the same as work is equal to force times distance. It's all just multiplication with different units. So the area under the graph and above and the interval on the x-axis. That tells us how much of an increase we'll see. So on this interval from zero to one, we see this area here. Is one. So you look at the area under the graph and above the interval on the x-axis. So now we can refine our statement. We could say on the interval from zero to one, we could say that F prime is positive on the interval from zero to one. And so we can say that F increases on the interval from zero to one. But since the area from the on the interval from zero to one is equal to one, if it's the area of that triangle, we could say it increases by one, that's the area. So the area tells us how much of an increase we'll see. On the interval from one to three, 
we see that the derivative is negative. So that's just what we observe on the graph. F prime is negative on the interval from one to three. So that tells us that F is going to be decreasing on the interval from one to three. And the area will tell us how much decrease we see. The area of this triangle is two. Base is two, height is two, so the area But this area is below the x-axis. So the area is two, but it's in, indicating a decrease. So F decreases, that's where we say the negative parts, by two. Oops. Spelled by incorrectly. And then we could do the same thing from three to five. And once again, we need the area over here. And that's another two. Any questions? This is much more advanced. This is two chapters ahead of our farthest point in this class so far. Not until chapter five does the book decide that you should learn about area under a curve. But I don't like this big open question. First derivative is positive, so the function is increasing. By how much does it increase? That is just a natural question that we should deal with now. No, from one to three, the area is two and it's below the x-axis. So the function will decrease by two. Because that's the area. So the reason I have under and above in quotes is that for the when the derivative is positive the function is above the x-axis but when the derivative is negative the function is below the x-axis so it's kind of under the x-axis and above the function but that's just multiplied by negative one Questions? Yes. Correct. Uh, correct, because f prime of one is equal to zero. So I can't say that f prime is positive on the interval from zero to one, including one. I have to exclude one because f prime of one is equal to zero. But when I say f is increasing, I can say whatever it starts off f of zero, f of one is one higher. So I can just go ahead and include those. Not because I, I refine my statement. Instead of just saying f is increasing on the interval from zero to one, I said if f, I said f increases by one on the interval from zero to one. So that's what, because I'm saying by how much it's increasing, I get to include the endpoints. If I just said F increases on the interval from zero to one, or F is increasing on the interval from zero to one, 
I would have left out the other things. Because I said, by how much? I wanted to be super pedantic and I said, well, that allowed me to use include the endpoints. Any questions? This is not an amount of uh, being pedantic that I would imp impose upon my students. If you just said F increases by one on the open interval from zero to one, that's that's fine. The important thing is that F is increasing and you know how much it increases. The other open question was, um, where does all this start? So the other important question is, from where does all this take place? Based on just the derivative, we don't know. The derivative is just saying you drove 300 miles. The derivative does not know from where you started or where you ended up. So the important thing here is that the derivative does not know. So if I want you to draw the graph of function, I have to tell you where it started or where it ended up or where it was at, in, at some point in the middle. I'd have to tell you a starting point. That's a piece of information that is not contained in the derivative. There were two mysteries that, we, that came up last week. Increases by how much? Decreases by how much? The area. Solve that one. The other one, from where does all this increase and decrease take place? You need information, additional information. The derivative does not have it. As for the rodents of unusual size, I don't believe they exist. So if, for example, I could, I could say that, suppose f of zero is equal to zero. Draw the graph of function. I have to give you that piece of information. So this is what it would look like for me to give you that information. I'd say here is a starting point. F of zero is equal to zero. Now we can draw the function. Once again, this is given information. On the interval from zero to one, we know that the function increases by one. So f of one is equal to one.
But then on the interval from one to three, we know that the function is decreasing by two. So we could figure out what happens at two. But at three, we know the function decreases by two. On the interval from three to five, my table is kind of falling off here. It's because I put my pens on this side, and so there's like gravity is warping my table. On the interval from three to five, we know that the function is increasing, and the area says it's increasing by two. So we'll go back up to one. So we can see generally what's going on here. It goes up, then down, then up again. We don't want to just connect these with lines because we have additional information. We not only have direction of function, we also have concavity of function. So since f, f prime is decreasing, on the interval from two uh, from zero to two and the interval from four to five. We're going to draw our function concave down. On zero to two and four to five. So instead of just going up with a line, then down with a line, I'm going to make it concave down on the interval from zero to two. Also going to draw a concave down on the interval from four to five. Clearly, I filled in some additional information. Somehow, I know that f of 2 is equal to 0, and f of 4 is equal to 0 as well. But back to concavity. f prime is increasing on the interval from 1 to, uh, sorry, from 2 to 4. So we'll draw f concave up on the interval from two to four. Kind of raise an important question there. How did I know that f two and f four were both equal to zero? 
aside from the fact that I wrote the problem and I decided that. So all this could only take place once I told you where to start. I told you that f of zero was equal to zero. The derivative only knows how things are changing and how things are bent, the concavity and the direction. It doesn't know where things started. I had to give you that extra piece of information. But notice that I drew a lot of extra space up at the top of my graph. I wonder what I'm going to do there. If you guessed I'm going to draw another graph, then you are correct. I'm going to give you a different starting value. And we're going to draw a function with a different starting value. So what if I told you, every time I say that now, I think of the matrix for the last 20 years. What if I told you that f of zero was equal to two? And you'd be like, oh, whoa, I know calculus. And I'll be like, oh, show me. And then everybody else breaks into the room. So I thought, Neo and Morpheus are doing calculus. And everybody goes running over to the monitors. Like, I'm not, I thought calculus was going to be a metaphor for fun too. They go, no, check it out. Intermediate value theorem. The all Morpheus. You know how to integrate, integrate. I don't know. I haven't been in an integral fight for a long time. No one will challenge me on an integral fight. I will crush them. Incidentally, if you challenge me to a fight, I think I've told you this before. If you challenge me to a fight, that means I get to choose the form of combat and I always choose integration. If I think that I don't want to toy with you, I go straight for trigonometric substitution. You challenge me? Let's see how you like my trigonometric substitution. By the way, this one will lead to secant to the fifth d theta. And as soon as I go, ah, it makes people's heads explode. So let's suppose that I told you was equal to two. So instead of starting down here at zero, I want to start at two. F of zero is equal to two. The changes are all still the same. If instead of starting at zero, we start at two, then when we increase by one, we'll be at three. Then when we decrease by two, we'll be at one. And then when we increase by two, we'll be back at three. So we'll increase by one, decrease by one, decrease by one again, increase by one, and increase by one. So notice that we get the same shape of the graph. I'll label this F1 of X. Notice that the graphs have the same shape. It's just that F2 is two units higher than F1.
So what we can observe if F1 is down here, and up here is F2 of X, we notice that we built F2 of X just by adding two to F1 of X. F2 of X is just F1 of X plus two. We know that if we take the derivative of f of f1 of x, we end up with f prime. What's the derivative of f2 of x? It's the same as the derivative of f1 of x plus the derivative of two. And what is the derivative of two? Zero. That's why they have the same derivative. Because the derivative of f2 of x is the f prime that we had above plus the derivative of two, which is zero, no change. That's why we got the same shape, just a vertical shift by whatever the difference is between our two starting values. Questions? Yes, Jeff. Um, what about this? This seems like a lot to remember, but that's only because it's a lot to remember. And you have to remember all of it all the time in perfect detail. Fortunately, the final's not for months, which is right around the corner. So. You got all kinds of time, but hurry up because you're running out of time. I've discovered that formalized learning and teaching is just manipulation. Yes, Jeff. Um, what this is tricky. If you're not okay with all this stuff, it's like, oh, now nah, this is partially confusing. It's supposed to be partially confusing. This is like day two, and I'm talking about uh, definite integral stuff. And that's like way later. I haven't even formally introduced definite integral stuff, but here I am talking about it. Because it came from a very simple place. We know that when the derivative is positive, the function is increasing. That raises a question by how much is the function increasing? How's everybody? Okay. If you're confused now, don't worry. That is normal. That is the correct answer. If you're like not confused at all, if you think everything makes sense, I assure you everything does not make sense. You're believing yourself. And number two, if it actually does fully make sense and there's no questions in your mind at all, then I don't know. Then I'm just, I'm not talking about you. Huh? Am I? You know what I mean? Whenever you do stuff in, in math class, it tends to raise more questions, but I think this is the goal of this entire proceeding. Not just this class, not just your program, but you should graduate with more questions than you had when you matriculated. If you don't graduate with more questions than you had when you matriculated, then you did college wrong. You're not here to get questions answered. You're here to learn how to ask more questions. Does that make sense? You shouldn't be as confused as when you graduated high school. I, I realize high school students know everything. My favorite is when my 15 year old semi nephew, it's like a nephew that's not related, but I'm, I'm like the uncle because otherwise I'm just my dad's friend. So I'm actually family now, not technically an uncle, it's Uncle Evan. But anyway, my nephew at 15 was talking about how unimportant math was. And I thought, ah, you've sussed that out from your 15 years of being alive. A good chunk at the beginning that you don't even remember because it's physically impossible for you to remember those first five years. Mm. You know what I mean? My like high school students know everything. I wish I knew what I knew in high school because I can do everything. I don't need to know this. I'm going to be a rock star. No. No, you're not. Maybe it'll break in. You're like, oh, okay. Maybe if that had happened, I'd be a better guitar player. Right? I'm not allowed to look into alternate dimensions to see alternate features. So I feel like, oh, hey, Leech, can you show me what happened? In one of the other over 14 million possibilities, I'd be like, oh, no, I'm not allowed to. 
Well, damn, a hundred million records is a lot. Wait, what? Nothing. Nothing. Any questions? Comments? Please talk. Yeah, where would you buy the stamps that I saw through the Oh, you can't buy it. That's that's the reason. That's why Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are so frustrated because you this is something that like money can't buy. They're like, I'm gonna go to space. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, in several of those possibilities, you explode on, on the launch pad. No, that doesn't happen. So I go, I've seen it. Buy me that ability. So I go, no, you don't have enough money. And that's why they take it out on the rest of us. Any other questions? Besides how to travel through time? I can teach you one way of traveling through time, but it's forward at 1.0 regular time. So, Welcome to the future. All right, that's it for today. I will see y'all tomorrow. Everybody have a good day. Thank you.